Thank you all very much for joining us on this very solemn and important occasion for the American people. Just one, over one month ago, our nation was shocked and horrified by the news of the shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown, Connecticut. Twenty children, six teachers and educators were taken from us at gunpoint. An act of senseless and incomprehensible violence struck at the heart of our families, of our schools, of our communities across the country. Earlier this month, shortly after Newtown, all members of Congress took an oath to protect and defend the Constitution and the American people. To protect and defend, that is our first responsibility. Today, leaders of the House Democratic Caucus have come together to fulfill that duty, to confront the challenge of gun violence in our society, to enact to ensure the safety and security of our communities. Under the leadership of Congressman, John Tom, uh, Congressman Thompson, Mike Thompson, our Gun Violence Prevention Task Force keeps growing in number. Our colleagues are submitting recommendations for legislation. The task force is working with outside organizations and sharing the latest information on gun violence and steps we can take and must take to end it. Today, to strengthen the efforts of this task force and our Democratic Caucus, we will hear from Americans with personal and professional experiences with gun violence and with critical expertise on how and why we must protect it. It's really an emotional occasion for many here. We thank them for sharing their grief to help other people be safe, to sharing their experience to help us all honor our oath of office. Our witnesses hail from every walk of life, education, academia, law enforcement, and public service. We are extraordinarily grateful to have with us Dr. Janet Robinson, Superintendent of Schools of Newtown, Connecticut. Dr. Emily Nottingham, mother of Gabe Zimmerman, you know, was um, a victim uh, in Tucson uh, nearly two years ago. Chief Scott Knight, Chaska Police Department here from Minnesota to give us a view from middle America, from rural areas. And Meryl M Michael Nutter, President of the U.S. Conference of Mayors, who has been a leader on this issue for a very long time. Your voices and your contributions are playing a critical role in our effort to take these long overdue actions. We look forward to hearing your ideas and testimony and answering the call on, to action on gun violence prevention. We are especially pleased to be doing so on a day when our president, as we continue to mourn with the families of Newtown, has told us that the time for action is now. We must do everything in our power to stop such terrifying violence in the future. We recognize that the challenges, these challenges are not new, and as President Obama said so eloquently in the days following the shooting, we can't tolerate this anymore. These tra tragedies must end, and to end them, we must change, he said. And today, the president put his proposals on the table. He outlined 23 executive actions his administration is taking right now. He demanded action from Congress on establishing a universal background check system, restoring the ban on assault weapons, banning high-capacity assault magazines, putting more police officers on our streets. We must in address issues of mental health to keep weapons out of the hands of those in danger of doing harm to themselves or to others. These common sense proposals, among others, represent steps, steps we can take and must take right away to put a stop to the violence. As the President said today, this time must be different. We agree. We cannot permit any more time to go by without action. We owe it to the families of the victims in Newtown, in Aurora, Oak Creek, Tucson, Virginia Tech, Columbine. The list goes on almost every day uh, across our country and shootings across America. I'm very pleased uh, <clears throat> to turn the meeting now over
to the co-chairs of our Steering and Policy Committee, Congresswoman Rosa DeLauro and Congressman Rob Andrews, who are pleased to be joined by our Chair of the Judiciary Committee, uh, Congressman John Conyers, and the Chair of our Gun Violence Prevention Task Force, Congressman Mike Thompson. I really thank you, Mike, for your leadership. And we are also joined by our distinguished whip, uh, Steny Hoyer. With that, I'm going to yield to Steny for a moment uh, and then to our co-chairs. Well, I thank you very much, uh, Madam Leader and uh, Chairman Andrews of the Steering Committee for scheduling this obviously critically and very timely uh, hearing and look forward to hearing from the witnesses. Clearly, all of us, as the President indicated uh, in his uh, talk today and presentation of his program and signing of executive orders, uh, we all feel the urgency of responding uh, to the dangers that uh, our communities confront uh, with the uh, distribution of guns and large capacity magazines and with the uh, status of our mental health observations, folks, who not to have guns and to make sure that we know who's getting uh, weapons of uh, a great danger to our community. So I, I appreciate the witnesses, I welcome them, uh, and uh, it is obviously an extraordinarily timely hearing. Uh, witness the, the attendance and the interest of the media and the public. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Madam Leader. Chairwoman DeLauro. Thank you very much, Madam Leader. Uh, it's a privilege uh, for me to welcome all of you, and I want to say a thank you to the leader for calling this hearing. I'm also pleased to join Rob Andrews co-chair of the Steering and Policy Committee and my other colleagues here today. I want to say a thank you to the distinguished panel for taking time uh, to join with us. And in fact, it is such a distinguished panel. Um, and let me just for a moment uh, want to uh, uh, personally thank and acknowledge all of you, but I have to say a, a welcome to our visitor from Connecticut, Superintendent Janet Robinson of Newtown, of the public school system. And I know that Janet has been working with uh, families, children, teachers, uh, first responders, uh, and a, a, an unbelievable organization, uh, the Yale Child Study Center in New Haven, along with Dr. Marins, on ways to help people work through this tragedy with their students. So I look forward to hearing more about this and to the testimony. Last month at Sandy Hook, a place where children should be safe to learn and to grow, the incomprehensible actions of a young man suddenly devastated a small town community. Six adults, 20 innocent children, all of them between six and seven years old, were murdered in cold blood. We have seen similar acts of terror and evil in Aurora and Portland, in Littleton and Blacksburg, in Oakland and Tucson, all across our country. And so we, we see the loss of life every day from gun violence all across this nation. After the unthinkable tragedy in Newtown, President Obama spoke to the country and he asked us, are we doing enough to protect our children? The answer, he admitted, is no. And that must change. That is why we are here today. In today's hearing, we'll hear from people who deal with the effects of gun violence every day. The wide range of experience and expertise from these panelists will facilitate a discussion on the common sense and constructive steps that we must take to ensure these sorts of tragedy will never happen again. I have a letter from the teachers of Newtown, which I will enter into the record, but I will just share with you one sentence, and it reads, in our schools, we need to strike the right balance to ensure that schools are nurturing while also safe. And we need to strike the right balance so that schools do not become armed fortresses where kids are unable to be kids. The voice of educators is critical to ensuring that we find and maintain this balance between safety and learning. As we move forward during this difficult time, collaboration, communication, value the voice and experience of all the members of our community, teachers, educators, law enforcement officials, the affected families, will be essential to making our schools and our streets safer, stronger, and more united. That's why we are here today, to prevent another Sandy Hook. We will all have to work together to end violence. I hope that we can continue that conversation today and how best to accomplish this and make our children safer. Thank you. I'd like to thank uh, our leader and my co-chair and colleagues. For we come to this room today from many different places and many different backgrounds. The last few months we have seen uh, too many of our 
fellow countrymen gunned down on the streets of American towns and cities every day. I represent Camden, New Jersey, a city of 80,000 people that had 70 homicides last year. We've seen our neighbors die in shopping malls and movie theaters, college campuses, and horrifically 31 days ago in elementary school. We are bonded together in this room today by one common conviction, and that is our belief that this is not inevitable. We can make choices to stop this from happening again. And we believe that consistent with good medical practice, we can improve our mental health system so that people who are demonized and tortured uh, can get help. We believe that consistent with good law enforcement practice, we can make our schools and our campuses and our public places safe in a responsible way. And yes, we believe that consistent with the Second Amendment to the Constitution of the United States and consistent with the common sense of the American people, that we can pass a law that makes it so that no one can own a gun that can fire 30 bullets in 30 seconds and that no one who has already proven that they are a risk to society will have the opportunity to buy any gun at all. We look forward to the perspective of the witnesses on these very pressing questions. I thank our colleagues, and I now know we're going to hear from the ranking member on our Judiciary Committee, Mr. Conyers. Thank you so much. Uh, it's important that we uh, recognize that the President of the United States, the Vice President of the United States, our leader, Pelosi, here in the Congress, and all of the members assembled here are committed to deal uh, for the very first time uh, this horrible gun violence uh, that is going on and deal with it in a meaningful way. And so I thank all of the witnesses for being here. I join with all my colleagues uh, in the uh, very importance of this matter. Uh, we have at least five members of the House Judiciary Committee here. And I, I just want to close with this one point that has now become uh, important, and that is addressing the mental health crisis in our country, in which uh, so many people suffer from some form of a mental problem. And so I applaud you all for being here, and I look forward to uh, this very important call to action. Thank you, Mr. Conyers. I'd like to introduce the chair of the uh, uh, the task force in the House of Representatives, Mike Thompson of California. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And Leader Pelosi, thank you for organizing today's hearing. And thank you to all the witnesses who came to share your expertise and, and your experiences uh, with us. As a hunter and a gun owner, I believe we should protect uh, law-abiding individuals' Second Amendment rights to own a firearm. As a dad and a grandfather, I also believe that we have a very important responsibility to make sure that our schools, our streets, and our communities are safe. And I know we can do both. And one thing's real clear, now's the time for action. There's too much gun violence. And there's no set of laws that will end the horrific shootings and senseless acts of violence. Uh, but that's no excuse for sitting around and doing nothing. The time's now. As the chair of the Gun Violence Prevention Task Force, I'm working on a comprehensive approach to reduce gun violence. I've met with everybody, Republicans, Democrats, gun right groups, gun safety groups, mental health experts, educational leaders, people from the video game and movie industry, hunting and sportsman groups, law enforcement leaders, and the Vice President of the United States of America and with my constituents. We know this is a complex issue. And in order to make any meaningful progress, it's going to take a complex solution. But every idea needs to be on the table, and everyone needs to be at that table in order for us to be successful. So thank you all for coming today. Thank my colleagues uh, for coming with your ideas. There's some great ideas out there. 
And I know that working together, we protect, uh, we can put public policy in place that will make our communities safer and at the same time protect law-abiding Americans' rights to own a firearm. Thank you. Madam Chair, it's evidence of the pervasiveness of this problem that many people in this room have felt in their own lives the heavy burden of the pain associated with this issue. Some are on this dais, and one we're going to hear from is Representative Carolyn McCarthy from New York. Thank you, and I thank uh, everybody for being here. You know, <clears throat> each time there's a shooting, especially over the last, I've been working on this issue for 18 years now, and everybody thinks that there's closure for victims. There is never closure for victims. It never goes away. And every time there's a shooting, each and every one of us go through that moment when the tragedy happened to our family. Um, my husband died, but my son was severely injured, left paralyzed. And it was during that time that he was learning how to speak again. He asked me why, and I didn't have the answer. And I'm saying this because it's grass people, roots, people like us that unfortunately went through this tragedy, that we're the ones that want to do the best we can to make sure no other family goes through what we've already gone through. Many here have already experienced that. I will say that this is the first time, a long, long time since President Clinton, that I actually have real hope that we can get something done to save lives. It's been a tough battle. And I would say to so many of the victims out there, there are times when we lose faith. There are times when we kind of want to give up. And all I can say is we can't give up. And the shootings have only gotten worse. And there are things that we could have done so many years ago that could have prevented so many of these killings. Not only the mass killings, it's also the shootings that happen every single day. Since what happened in Connecticut with those children and the teachers, 900 people have died from gun violence. I keep count. I keep count. Because it's going to be up to all of us to try to talk to some of our members on both sides of the aisle that we as Americans will stand with them if they stand with us on trying to reduce gun violence. They do not have to be afraid of the radical NRA. And I say that because there are many gun owners in this country that are good citizens, and they should not be tagged with some of these atrocities that are happening. And it's those that we have to call upon to reach out to their members of Congress throughout this country, because we are here to do the right thing. The president and the vice president are there to do the right thing, and they're going to use their office. But if we as Americans don't also raise our voice, then this will begin another losing battle. We cannot afford to lose another battle. We have common sense issues to stop gun violence holistically, but when it comes down to it, the assault weapons, large magazines that were made for our police officers and our military have no right to be on the street, and they do not. And I will say to you, as our leader has said, we are all take the oath of the Constitution of the United States. We have never tried to infringe on that to legal gun owners. And the package that our coalition, which in, uh, agrees with the president and the vice president, can make a difference. We know we can't save every single life. I was a nurse for many years before I came here. And the best of the best couldn't save every single life. But that doesn't mean that we couldn't try to make sure that we did as much as we could to save those lives. That is what we're fighting for. And it's heartening to see everybody here. And it was so heartening to see people this morning at the White House that really care about this issue and have been fighting this issue for longer than me. Victims that I haven't seen in 10 and 15 years, still out there fighting. We can make a difference, because this time it is different. It is different because 
Those children, those children are an example of what happens daily in this country. And it has to stop. We're Americans. We're better than that. We are better than that. And we cannot allow a group, a small minority of this country, to stop us from doing the right thing. Thank you. Now gives me a great pleasure to introduce a, a newly elected colleague from Connecticut uh, who will uh, introduce our first witness, and that is Congresswoman Elizabeth Esty from Connecticut, in whose district Andy Elementary School uh, resides. So, uh, and what we will do is to have all of the uh, uh, various members introduce our, our witnesses and. Um, uh, then we will proceed with the testimony. Um, Congresswoman Esty. Thank you so much to my good friend Rosa DeLauro. And thank to you to all of you for being with us here today as witnesses to what happened in our community of Newtown, Connecticut, and as a call to action for what we must do as a country. I'm honored today to have the chance mm. to introduce Janet Robinson, who has become a good friend, who is a true American hero who responded in a time of unbelievable tragedy. For five years, Dr. Janet Robinson has served as the superintendent of schools in Newtown, Connecticut. Throughout her career, she has shown a constant and loving commitment to education and improving the lives of children. In addition to having served as superintendent of schools in three different Connecticut communities, Janet has served as a teacher, a school counselor, and a school psychologist. I met Janet in the firehouse, which was the emergency center of Newtown, Connecticut, on the afternoon of the shootings. Janet was grieving. She was there with parents of children who didn't know if their children were going to come home. And as we know, 20 of them did not. And the next morning, this brave woman sat around a conference table with the Board of Ed members of her community and began planning for how to protect those children and those families, how to reopen a school and get children back to learning. She is an extraordinary person. She was putting Sandy Hook community first, the teachers, the children, and those families, and thinking about what she did. it, And she did it all the time with her heart broken for her friends who were cut down on that terrible day. Janet, I know you will provide invaluable expertise to us in today's hearing. You're an expert on children, on teaching, but most importantly, and for our purposes today, you are an expert on the price of inaction. You are an expert because Newtown has paid this price. Your children paid this price. Your teachers paid this price. Your administrators paid this price. And the community paid a price. You speak with unquestionable authority on that subject. You've lived what has happened when we as political leaders don't act. You can speak to us here today on who these people were. Tell us about Don Hawksprung, the extraordinary principal and leader of that school. These incredible children, three of whose, several of whose parents came today at the president's announcement. Who these aides were, who these families are, and the extraordinary community that you are a member of. What we need to do here today, and with your help and guidance, you need to help us about how to prevent tragedy, about how to save lives, how to ensure that no other community endures what Newtown, Connecticut has gone through. What happens now, we could not prevent what happened then, but we can go forward. This is about what happens now. I want to thank you for your extraordinary leadership and courage in your community and in coming here today. Thank you so very much. Uh, our next introducer is someone who bears both the physical and emotional scars of this issue. Uh, he stood by the side of our colleague, Gabby Giffords, on the day of that horrific event in Arizona. He has stood by her ever since, and now he occupies her seat. Congressman Ron Barber of Arizona. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Madam Leader, for bringing us together uh, to hear from this panel, <clears throat> excuse me, and to uh, reflect on what we as a nation can do to prevent any kind of reoccurrence. Um, it's my honor today to introduce Emily Nottingham. She's from uh, Tucson. Uh, Emily and I have known each other for a long time, even before I knew her son. She worked for 30 years in the city of Tucson um, as an administrator for affordable housing, community development, and social services, and held that position until her retirement not too long ago. Beyond that, she is active in many community organizations, and I'm very proud to say she was uh, uh, one of the first people to join the advisory board for the Fund for Civility, Respect, and Understanding, an organization that my family and I established shortly after the shooting in Tucson. She's also an outdoors person, as was her son, and uh, is on the board of the Arizona Trail Association and many other nonprofits. She's also the proud mother of two young men, uh, Ben and Gabe Zimmerman. Um, when I was district director for Congresswoman Giffords, Gabe was the first person we hired. He was my transition buddy. We worked in a, in a small office. I called it an office. Gabe called it a closet. Um, but it was uh, a place where we put together the management of Congresswoman Gifford's uh, staff and, and offices early on. He was my go-to guy, a young man uh, with such compassion and caring um, that it's just beyond the pale to think that he's no longer with us. He learned about service from his mother. Uh, she served, as I said, for many years, uh, people who uh, were disadvantaged in our community. It was Gabe who uh, set up the Congress on Your Corner that fateful day on January 8th, and um, he was killed at that event. Uh, he died right beside me as I lay after being shot myself. I will never, ever forget the image of Gabe dying by my side. I know for certain that his last action was to come and try to help us, uh, help Congresswoman Giffords, help me, help Judge John Roll, and for doing that, he was shot. Some of us here in uh, Congress um, uh, meet regularly uh, in a room that is named in his honor, the Gabe Zimmerman Room, and every time I go there for meetings, I remember this young man. His mother has been very active since, she's always been active in our community, but particularly active since the tragedy in Tucson. Um, she uh, is willing and able to speak at any number of events and has done so to lend her personal um, understanding of what it means to lose a son in a tragedy like this. Um, we were shot with a Glock with a clip or a magazine, I should say, that had 33 bullets in it. And I know we need to do something about that, and I know Emily wants to do something about it as well. So it's my great honor to uh, welcome Emily Nottingham to hear her testimony this afternoon. Thank you. Okay. And I'll hear from our colleague, uh, Keith Ellison uh, from Minnesota for the introduction of Chief Scott Knight. Thank you, Madam Chair and Madam Leader. On behalf of my colleague, Betty McCullum, uh, and I, I'm privileged to introduce uh, Scott Knight, who is the Chief of Police of Chaska, Minnesota. But uh, I would be very remiss if I did not mention that uh, Mayor R.T. Ryback of the City of Minneapolis, a leader in Mayors Against Guns, is here with us. And also Maya Rahimam, who tragically lost her father uh, in a act of gun violence not more than a few uh, months ago. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, Chief Scott Knight started his career with the Chaska Police Department in 1976 and has been a police chief since 2000. The city of Chaska is located only a short distance from the Twin Cities. Chief Knight was appointed to the International Association of Chiefs of Police Executive Committee and has served as chair of the IACP Firearms Committee from 2005 to 2012. He's been a leader in law enforcement's fight against gun violence, and law enforcement is a key constituency if we are going to bring uh, this, uh, this uh, spate of gun violence uh, under control. Uh, 
Chief Knight has also uh, not only been a leader uh, to fight against gun violence, but also violence against officers and the illegal gun trade. In 2010, yeah, the IACP joined nine other major law enforcement organizations to form the National Law Enforcement Partnership to Prevent Gun Violence. Chief Knight was chairman of the partnership during its first year. In 2008, Chief Knight received the Minnesota Chiefs of Police Association's President's Award for his work on gun violence and other safety issues, and an officer safety issues as well. Uh, he has testified before Congress before and is an expert in this area, and we're very pleased to uh, greet you here today, Chief. Thank you. Our final introducer is my friend and neighbor from the city of Philadelphia, Congressman Shaka Fatah. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, we are about to uh, celebrate the uh, life and legacy of Dr. King, and we reminded that on that balcony at the Lorraine Motel in Memphis, he was shot down. And whether President Reagan or President Kennedy, who uh, were both shot, uh, one killed and one uh, almost uh, fatally wounded, uh, we are reminded here in Washington all the time of the dangers of guns. That's why all of you went through the security protections to come into this building. And the Supreme Court that ruled that uh, everyone has a right to bear arms also makes it clear you can't bring them into the Supreme Court. Uh, so that's because we actually know that guns are dangerous. Uh, and that, um, so as much as uh, people may proclaim one thing, you have to look at their actions. Uh, and on the floor of the House, uh, we saw a member shot down once, so that's why we have bulletproof things and other kinds of protections. Sure, um, sure. Mayor Nutter is someone who, as, a, as someone growing up in West Philadelphia, the best place in the world to grow up, and as a former councilman and now as a second-term mayor of our city, is in so many respects America's mayor now. He's the president of the U.S. Conference of Mayors. But we've worked together on gun buybacks, but he's had to counsel families of police officers who've been killed, uh, young children in our city. Uh, and so as much as we might think about famous people who have been shot, uh, there are literally um, dozens of children, over 50 a day, shot every day in our country. And Mayor Ryback, it's good to see you and the great work of the Mayors Against Illegal Guns. There's so much more that could be said, but it's much more important that we hear from the witnesses. I want to welcome uh, my friend and uh, the leader of the United States Conference of Mayors uh, here today, and um, we await his testimony. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. We're honored by each of your presence, and we'd like to begin with a, a woman of incredible character and courage, Dr. Janet Robinson. <laughs> 